Can you pray for those uh, individuals in the Philippines that have been devastated by the storms that hit there? Uh, we have some families here at Lakeshore from the Philippines, and they've told me that uh, they're uh, where they're from in the Philippines was not really devastated so much by the storm. So we're very grateful for that. They were in the northern part there. But it's the more the central part of the Philippines that was hit the hardest. Uh, so we want to be lifting them up in prayer. There's a lot of loss, a lot of devastation there. But I have seen time and time again where God can even work at a time that something really bad like that to just draw people to him to find the help and the care and the comfort that they need. So let's pray for that as real needs are being met there in the Philippines as well. Also, uh, it's uh, important for us to remember people in prayer when we know of, of a health crisis that might be going on. Uh, Lori Schrader, we've been praying for her dad, Larry Schrader, for a while. Uh, we got word that Larry uh, has taken a turn for the worse, and they've called the family in. So Lori's gone there to be with the family. Be praying for her and with the family during this time of, of uh, very critical health on the part of her father. So be lifting them up in prayer. And I am always, always overjoyed. Every time I see people coming in the doors here at Lakeshore, I just love this church family. Uh, and again, today, I was just overjoyed. We've been praying especially for Denise Trice. She's been going through a very critical time with her health. And Denise is sitting here with us this morning, right out here. We're so thankful. Yeah. And God continues to do amazing things there. We're so grateful for that. We always want to acknowledge that and thank him and praise him for that. Uh, as he continues to work in all of our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We could come to you today and we can celebrate the fact that even with the hardest of things that we face, no matter what it is, you have, as our Father, demonstrated a love for us that knows no bounds. A love so great that you would give your son Jesus to die for us on the cross. So no matter what it is we're facing, we know that your love is there for us. Your power, your presence, your provision, your care is there for us. If we would only turn to you, if we would lean on you, if we would surrender everything to you. So we lift up to you the prayer needs of our church family right now, whatever they are. We know that you will hear us. We know that you will answer our prayers in a way that's best. Father, we praise you for that and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing this series called The Story. This week we're on what chapter? Anybody? 16, right, chapter 16. How many of you read chapter 16? A lot of you did. That's great. If you don't have a book yet, it's not too late. We still have some books. We have some children's books available too. If you want to get a book and do this together as a family, you can read these stories with your children. It's a great way to do that with your family. Uh, we uh, Just stop by the information desk. Let them know you need to get a book. They'll be glad to help you with that. Each week, as we go through the story, it's written in chronological order. It's a collection of scriptures that is put into chronological order so you can follow history, how God in the upper story has been working throughout history to accomplish the overriding will of God, which, of course, is the salvation of his creation. He wants to bring us back to him. But each week, we've looked at a part of the lower story where God has worked through individuals and uh, through their lives, he has orchestrated things to accomplish that overriding goal of bringing us back to him in a right relationship with him. So I hope you're still reading and making that connection. There's no way on Sundays we could cover everything in the chapter. So it helps if you read those chapters yourself. You could get more of the details of all that was going on. But each week we'll focus on a part of what was talked about in each of those chapters. We're going to do that again this week. The title of the message this week is The Beginning of the End. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you could be headed toward disaster and you don't even realize it, but the people around you can see it? They could see that you're headed down a path that, that's going to bring heartache or pain or destruction, even when you don't see it. And, and I have known uh, for a long time that, that as we make those choices that may be bad choices for us, God is very aware of that, and he is always at work trying to get our attention. And he does it through a lot of different means, a lot of different methods to try to get our attention. I'm convinced that nobody, well, very few people, there may be some, but very few people intentionally go down these, this path or making these choices that are going to bring pain or heartache and destruction. Usually, we're, we're not intentionally trying to go that direction, but we end up on that path sometimes. Most of us, I think I probably everybody in the room today, really desires to have God's blessing in your life. 
That's part of the reason you're here, I think, a lot of us. We want to have God's blessing. And in order to have God's blessing, we got to have we got to have a knowledge of where we need to place ourselves, what kind of life we need to be living in order to have those blessings in our lives. And that's what Scripture is all about. That's what the story is really all about, is God wanting to bless us and how He wants to accomplish that in the upper story and then individually for us in our lower stories. I was reminded as I was preparing this message of uh, our son Bobby when he was growing up. Uh, He grew up, he has a cousin uh, that he was close to growing up named Ryan, my older brother's son. And oftentimes, for a while there, we lived kind of close to each other. They lived in Clarksville. He was stationed at Fort Campbell there. And, and Bobby and Ryan were able to spend a lot more time together during that time. And they would play together and do things together. And one of the things they got into was Nintendo game. And the game they really got into the most was a game called Castlevania II, Simon's Quest. It was one of these games where you have to, to defeat certain uh, uh, enemies that would come along the way, and you need to get weapons that were good, and you need to get more power. You, you could get more power by, by killing certain uh, uh, enemies and things like that. You could get certain tools to use, and you get to certain levels, and it would give you clues all along the way that would help you go further in the game if you listened to those clues and followed their instructions. But this game was before the more sophisticated games like we have today, this game, back in the day, would not save your information if you quit playing and you didn't use the codes they gave you to save where you were, then when you went back to play it again, you'd have to start all over from the beginning again, right? So Bobby and Ryan had this piece of paper. We didn't know this, but they had this piece of paper where they were writing down all this information and these clues and these codes so that if they had to stop today, when they came back to play it again, they could enter that and start back at the level they had achieved already. So you had to do it, or otherwise you had to start over. Well, they, for months, were playing this game. Every time they got together and they were getting further and further along in the game and they were listening to all the clues and getting all the codes and they were very close to defeating this game. And they were at our house. Ryan was spending the night at our house one Friday night and Bobby and Ryan were playing that game until late at night and they were on just the brink of defeating this game. But it was so late, Sue Ann and I said, you got to stop and go to bed. You have to go to bed. It's just too late. And they finally gave in, and we got them to go to bed. And we didn't know it, but they had written down their code on this piece of paper. This piece of paper was old and worn and crumpled. They'd been saving it for months. And they wrote this code down on this paper, and they went to bed. Well, the next morning is Saturday morning, and they're sleeping late, like kids their age would often do. And Sue Ann got up early. She's an early morning person. And she was cleaning early on Saturday morning. You know what's coming, right? (laughs) And she finds this crumpled up piece of paper with this scratch all over it that she can't really read. She has no idea what it is. And she throws it away and takes the trash out to the dumpster. And it's gone. Well, a little later on, Bobby and Ryan get up. And the first thing they want to do, because they know they've got the code. They know they're about to defeat this game. They go turn on that Nintendo, and they're ready to win the game, and they start looking, and the paper's nowhere to be found. They don't tell us right away. They start turning everything over, looking through everything. They, uh, they look through all their clothes and their drawers. They look through everything. They cannot find it. They know they left that paper, and they cannot find that piece of paper anywhere. And finally, they come to us and say, did you happen to see a piece of paper over here by the game and do anything with that? For one of the very few times in my life, I wasn't the one that messed up. (laughs) My wife had thrown that paper away. And even today, I called Bobby as I was preparing this message. I said, now, I don't know what game this was. Can you tell me? He could tell me the exact game and every detail of what happened (laughs) with that piece of paper. It was that big to him. Now, the reason I bring that up is this. I have noticed that we human beings have this tendency when we're reading scripture and we're going to church and we're trying to have God's blessings in our lives, it's like we're looking for some secret code to make God do for us what we want God to do for us. 
to give us the extra power, the extra lives, the, the weapons we need to, to accomplish what we want to accomplish in life. We want the code to manipulate God, to get God to do for us what we want God to do for us. And so we're looking for those key things in Scripture, that if we do this, if we have this formula, if we say this, and, and that's why people are so gullible that you will buy a prayer cloth off of the Internet. That somebody's handprint's been dipped in oil and you buy that prayer cloth to put over that place that hurts because you think it's some secret formula that's going to do something for you. And some of you are laughing at that, but I've seen some of you post things on the internet, on Facebook. If you say this out loud three times <laughs> and you forward it to ten people, God will do a miracle for you today. Here's the code. You can manipulate God and make God do what you want him to do. And friends, that's the opposite of what our relationship with God is supposed to be like. We should never think we're in the position that we're supposed to manipulate God. God's in the position that we should be conforming to him, period. It never works the other way around. Let's stop trying to control him and start more and more allowing him to control us. That's our relationship with the God of the Bible. Today, we're studying God's word in chapter 16. We're looking at a period of history. I want you to know as we look at this story today that there is no secret code in the Bible. There is no formula to control and manipulate God. But here's what we do find in Scripture. And it's revealed to us in this chapter again this week. There is a lifestyle that God blesses. Amen. Right. We need to know that. We need to be honest about that. There's a lifestyle that God doesn't bless too. It works both ways here. There's a lifestyle that he blesses. There's a lifestyle where he removes his hand of blessing as well. That's the reality that is revealed to us in Scripture. And we've seen this cycle repeated in the story so far. That's we're looking at again in this chapter. And you're thinking, when is the cycle going to end? The truth is, it's still going on right now with us. The cycle that says, we'll honor God, we'll submit to him, we'll let him have control, and we want his blessings. So when we get his blessings, here's the cycle. As we get blessed, as God is, is blessing us with all these great things that he's done for us, that he's provided for us, what we tend to do, like they did in the story we're looking at today, like we, we've seen in our own recent history as human beings, is as we get blessed, we start pushing God out again. And we start thinking, we're the ones doing this. We, we've just, you know, we're just smarter and we're harder workers and we just are wiser and we've just learned how life really works. And now we're the ones providing these blessings for ourselves. And we don't need God so much anymore. And we start turning to the idols of our culture, depending on them instead of depending on God. In our lesson today in chapter 16 of the story, we are looking at a time where you already know that if you were here the last couple of weeks, the kingdom that God established of Israel has been divided into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And uh, the northern kingdom has really gotten heavily involved in idol worship. And we're talking about here a time of the kings, a time of the prophets that went on for about 208 years, it says in Scripture. And in those 208 years, there were 38 kings. And out of those 38 kings, only five of them are said to be people who had a heart for God. Out of 38 35 of them rebelled against God. And because of that, I mean, 33 of them rebelled against God. It says they did evil in the eyes of God. So they thought, remember, if God let us have a king. That'll fix everything. Everything will be good. Good. Just let us have a king like the other nations have. And for 208 years, God said, okay, I'll let you have kings if that's what you think you want to have. And, and only five of them were kings that honored God. Now, during that same 208-year period, God also sent messengers. 
Nine prophets during that time that we have a record of in Scripture. God used them as messengers because these kings would lead them off track. The kings would get off track. The nation would get off track. So God, in his love for them, did not want them to suffer the consequences of that. So he sent messengers, prophets, to warn them, you're going the wrong way. You're going down the wrong path. It's going to lead to destruction. It's the beginning of the end for you if you don't turn some things around. And so he would send out of love these messengers. In 2 Chronicles 36 and verses 15 and 16, we see how they responded to God sending these prophets. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy you know what that means it means even though God loves us and he wants to do everything he can to warn us and teach us and call us back because he is a righteous God there is a limit beyond which God will not go there's a limit where he says enough is enough your rebellion is so strong And you are so entrenched in it that I have no choice as a righteous God but to allow you to suffer the consequences of the path that you have chosen. We can't judge when somebody's reached that point, but God can. God knows when you've reached that point. And when we reach that point, here's what God does. He does not inflict pain on you. He just removes his hand of blessing. And allows you to have the consequences of the choices that you're making. Now God gets to blame when things go bad. But God has done nothing but remove his hand of blessing and protection. And we have made the choices that bring the consequences. The hurt, the pain, the suffering, the devastation that comes into our lives. And what we're looking at today is a case where the northern kingdom has reached that point. Where even though God sent warning after warning, prophet after prophet, messenger after messenger, they mocked God. And the Bible says, be sure of this, God will not be mocked. You choose that path, you have to understand. You're choosing the fact that you're mocking a God who refuses to be mocked. And he will remove that hand of blessing and destruction will come. So he withdrew his hand of blessing from the northern kingdom, and the Assyrian army was powerful. They had been growing stronger and stronger. The scripture tells us a little bit about that army, about the number of soldiers that they had, 185,000 strong in their army, and they were well equipped, and they went in, and they took possession of the northern kingdom. They took control. They conquered the city of Samaria and the surrounding areas. They they took control, and God's people there were scattered. They no longer existed as a kingdom anymore. Now the Assyrians ruled and controlled that area. God simply withdrew his hand. Up until that time, he had been protecting them from this. But because of their rebellion, because of their sin, God allowed the Assyrian army to come destroy the kingdom in the north. As bad as that was, he still had the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom had the advantage of watching this unfold. And they had a prophet, Isaiah, who was speaking to the people at the time, warning them by saying, look at what happened to the northern kingdom. Look at how God withdrew his hand of blessing from them. I want you to learn from what they did. I want you to learn from what happened there. God wants you to learn from that example so it doesn't happen to you too. Warning the southern kingdom through Isaiah. Isaiah said, you know why this happened? It's because they turned to these idols. They turned to these foreign gods. They put their trust in them and they forgot God and they forsook God. And that's why they're going through what they're going through right now. Pay attention to that. You know what I found that God does? When he sees us because he loves us so much, when he sees us going down the wrong path, he has different ways that he tries to get our attention. I'm convinced of that. He's done it in my life when I've been going down the wrong path. And sometimes one of the ways that he will try to get our attention is through giving us his message, giving us his word. 
Sometimes it comes through a preacher. Sometimes it comes through a friend or a family member. God sends us a warning through his word with, from somebody that cares enough about you to share God's word with you. Somebody that loves you enough to say, warning, pay attention, you're going down a path. It's the beginning of the end. If you keep going that way, it's going to bring destruction. I'm thankful for people in my life who've loved me enough to help be that messenger from God in my life. To get me back on track again. Sometimes he does that. And some of you know that. There are some of you sitting here today. I know what's going to happen. You probably didn't even want to be here today. It's storming outside. You didn't want to get out in the weather. You ended up here anyway. Somehow you got here, right? And something in this message is going to speak directly to you. It's not by chance that you're here. God has orchestrated this. You know how I know that? Because week after week after week after the sermon, people will come say, Pastor Andy, that sermon today was just for me. And it'll be 12 different people tell me that. And they'll say, do you have my house bugged? <laughs> and as far as you know, we don't. <laughs> the government might, but we don't. Okay. I don't have to bug your house. There's somebody already there listening in, watching all the time. God knows what's going on in your life. And so one of the way he's, he, ways he warns you when you're getting off track is if you'll show up and listen up, he'll talk to you. He will give you the message you need to hear to get you turned around and get you back on track. I can't take blame for that or credit for that when that message stepped on your toes that day. I don't know all the details of your life well enough to do that for you, but God does. And so he speaks through his messengers. And he brings you a word of correction in your life. And he does that not because he's wanting to punish you, but because he's wanting to protect you and bring blessing to you, to bring you back to where you need to be. But another way he does that is through the example of others who've gone down the path that you are headed down, and you can see what happened to them. You can see the pain, the destruction, the heartache that came to them. And that should serve as a warning that if you go down that path, guess what? You're not immune from that either. It will happen to you. The pain, the heartache, it will come into your life too. I remember a poster years ago as I was preparing this message. The poster said, it could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. <laughs> you know people like that? Yeah. Now, I know that's not the whole purpose of their life in God's eyes. But, but sometimes their life could really serve as a warning, can it? One of the most successful anti-drugs campaigns they had is, is this is your brain on drugs. You know, you see what happens when you really use drugs. This is what it looks like when you use drugs. It's because if you see it, if you can really visualize, this is really what will happen if I keep going this direction. Sometimes that's a warning that's good enough, that, that gets your attention enough that you'll, it'll get you to rethink what you're doing, where you're going. Okay? So the southern kingdom has this advantage. They can see what happened to the northern kingdom. They can see where their decisions took them. And God withdrawing his hand of blessing and them coming on their foreign enemy now. It's kind of like in golf. Some of you play golf here. If you've got two balls on the green, you're playing with somebody and you're the one further away and they're in your line where you want to putt, they'll mark their ball and then you putt first if you're the furthest away and they get an advantage. Guess what? They get to see the line that your ball takes to the hole. And so they can make adjustments because they watched the break that your ball had as it got to the hole. Well, the advantage that we have as Christians today is we have God's word right here in our possession. Full of example after example after example. These people made good choices and God blessed those choices. Guess what? That's a good example to look at. It also has these people made bad choices. And this is where it took them. And this is the suffering and the pain that it caused. Those are valuable warnings too, aren't they? If we'll be willing to treasure that information, to understand how valuable it is to have that information ahead of time, we could avoid so many bad decisions, couldn't we? We could avoid so much pain and heartache and destruction. And we could warn generations coming behind us so they don't go through some of that suffering and that pain and that heartache because they heard the truth about those things from those who were going before them. So God, through the northern kingdom, is warning the southern kingdom. And he has warned them 
that listen, if you keep going down the path, because they were worshiping idols too, they were turning away from God too. If you keep going down this path, it's going to be a problem. It's going to bring heartache. It's going to bring destruction. Your kingdom is not immune from what happened to the northern kingdom either. Well, the Assyrian army, after they conquered the northern kingdom, guess what their next target was? Southern kingdom. They decided, well, the God of the northern kingdom didn't protect them. We were able to go in and defeat them. We can do that in the southern kingdom too. So now they're ready to go in and take the southern kingdom. So would the southern kingdom, would they respond to the warning? Well, they had an X factor that I want us to focus on today. His name was Hezekiah. He was one of those five kings in that 208-year history who had a heart for God and the things of God. And Hezekiah was someone who recognized the warning of what happened to the northern kingdom. And even though he was a young king, he was going to call the people to respond to the warning. In 2 Chronicles 32, and verses 7 and 8, Hezekiah says this to his people. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, had said. Sounds a lot like Joshua, doesn't it? Be strong and courageous. That's the message God was bringing to the people through Hezekiah. That if they would depend on him, if they would look to him as the source, as the deliverer, as the provider, God would fight battles for them like he had for his people all throughout history. Now, the Assyrians were pretty crafty. The king of the Assyrians at that time, he said, you know what? We want to take the southern kingdom, but I don't think we'll even have to fight a battle to take them. We can do this through intimidation. They already saw what happened to the northern kingdom. They've seen us defeat every enemy we've ever faced. So here's what they did. They sent messengers into the southern kingdom. And they sent these messengers to speak to them in Hebrew, their own language, to tell them, you don't have a chance. I know Hezekiah said to be strong and courageous, but guess what? No God of any people has been able to stand up against our army. We've been able to defeat everybody we fought. You might as well give up now. You might as well not even try. You know how the enemy whispers in your ear when you're facing something hard? God can't help you with this. God can't give you victory over this. God can't win this battle. You might as well just give up. And that's what the enemy was doing to the southern kingdom, to Judah. They were saying, you can't win this battle. In fact, they said, your God doesn't have a chance against me and my powerful army. Now, when somebody says that, here's what I want you to do. Back up. Back away from anybody talking like that. If they start calling out your God, just get as far away from them as you can. Because remember, God will not be mocked. And somebody that's mocking God like that and saying that God can't take care of them, you don't want to be too close to them when God decides to take care of that guy. <laughs> you don't. You might as well back up. Get some space between you and that person because God is not going to let that slide when people challenge him that way. Sooner or later, God responds. And he responded to these guys in a big, big way. Second Chronicles 32 and verse 20. Here's how Hezekiah responded to these threats. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. They realized what, what, the, uh, what the Assyrian army was doing, the tactics they were using. So where did they go? They went to God. Now, they also did everything they could to prepare in case there was a battle. But then they went to God. They recognized that God was their source of victory here, not their own preparations. Verse 21 is my favorite verse in this chapter. The Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the commanders and officers of the camp of the Assyrian king. Game over. <laughs> Doesn't say game over, but you know, game's over, right? He just, God himself, went in there and annihilated the Assyrian army with an angel. The armies of Judah didn't have to do anything. They didn't even have to go to one battle. God just went in and wiped out this army with an angel. It says, so he, the, the king of the Assyrian army, 
withdrew to his own land in disgrace. And when he went into the temple of his God, thinking he would be safe there, some of his sons, his own flesh and blood, cut him down with a sword. Whoa. Hezekiah had said, he's got the arm of the flesh. You've got the God, the creator God of the universe. I like those odds. Don't you? We need to understand that if we're going to have blessing and victory in our lives, it is not because of us or our numbers or our, uh, our, our craftiness or our wisdom and our strength and our, uh, and our own abilities. If we have blessing and victory in our lives, it's because God provides that for us. The God that we love and worship, the God of the Bible, provides that. So God showed up in a powerful way there to give them blessing. Now here's the sad thing. After Hezekiah dies, guess what happens to the southern kingdom? They revert back to their old ways, and they are destroyed by the enemy. You would think, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you think they would have learned from that one example, if nothing else, that you can't turn away from God and keep the blessing of God in your life? You can't have it both ways. But the encouraging thing to me is this. As bad as they were, as far away from God as they had gotten, when one generation under the leadership of Hezekiah turned back to God, what did God do? He put his hand of blessing on them again. He took care of them again. That gives us hope. It gives me hope in my life personally. It gives us hope as a church. It gives us hope as a nation. That if in one generation we would turn back to God, the hand of the blessing of God would be on us again. It would be on our individual lives. It would be on us corporately as a church. It would be on our nation if we would turn to God. There are some key characteristics or key traits in Hezekiah's life that I believe were those key traits that God was looking for in that generation so that he could put his blessing on them again. And I want us to learn those key traits because I want those blessings. I don't think you'd be here today if you didn't want those blessings. So let's see what it was about Hezekiah that caused God to honor him and his prayer and bring those blessings to his life. Maybe it would help us to bring those attributes more strongly into our lives and we could have more of God's blessing individually too and corporately. Well, the first thing I see that stood out about Hezekiah more than anything else was a commitment to purity. That's number one on your outline. A commitment to purity. In fact, when you read about his reign as king, this was the most identifying mark, the one that stood out above everything else, was his commitment to purity. He said when he became king, we're going to purify this place and purify ourselves as the people of God. Now, purity means you get rid of that which is impure, and what's left behind is that which is pure, okay? And so he looked at them as a people, and he said, you know what? God had led us to build a temple there in Jerusalem. They still had the temple. But you know what they had done with the temple of God? They had defiled the temple of God. They brought in all these impure things into the temple of God. And the worship of God was no longer going on in the temple. Now they were worshiping idols. And, and things associated with the worship of idols had been brought into the temple that was supposed to be the temple of God. So he said, you know what? We've got to purify the temple if we want God to be with us and bless us. If we want his hand of blessing back in our lives, we've got to purify this temple. In 2 Chronicles 29, beginning with verse 1, we see a, a, a great few verses here that tell us what Hezekiah set out to do right away when he became king. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. So he's just a young man, but already he's mature enough to know what needs to happen here, okay? He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. In the first month of the first year of his reign, I like the way that's worded, as soon as he took office, the first month that he was in office, he started taking care of this, purifying the temple. Look at what it says. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. They were in disrepair because they were no longer worshiping God there the way they were supposed to, Okay. In verse 4, he brought in priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east side and said, listen to me, Levites. 
Why is he coming down so hard on them? Because they were supposed to be the priestly tribe that were leading in the worship of God. He said, you better listen to me. Here's what we're going to do because we want God's blessings again. Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove, get this, all defilement from the sanctuary. Here's what I've learned. There's no secret code, but there's a lifestyle that God blesses. There is. And the first step in a lifestyle that God blesses is to remove that which defiles God from the temple. I want you to get the connection here. Because the whole Old Testament was pointing toward a new covenant that was coming. And under the new covenant, under Jesus Christ, the temple is not a building in Jerusalem anymore. You know where the temple is under the new covenant? It's your body. The scripture says your body is a temple of God, a temple of the Spirit of God. This is where God dwells now under the new covenant in us individually. So if we want this life to be blessed, what do we got to do with this temple? We got to remove that which is defiling to God. We got to get the impurities out of the temple if we want God's blessing and presence and power in our lives. I found that we've got a real problem with this in our culture for a couple of reasons. It begins with purification. And here's what the problem is. We want to be blessed by God, but we do not want to live in the brokenness that is necessary for purification in our lives. We don't want to go there. We want the blessing without the purification. That's why we come to church and live totally outside the will of God. Week after week after week. We live together outside of marriage. Even though God says that defiles the temple. We get active sexually outside of marriage. Even though God says that defiles the temple. We are gluttonous in our eating. That's the temple too. And he puts gluttony right on the same level as sexual sins in scripture. And we defile the temple. We're going outside of the will of God, attending church week after week, and praying, God, please keep blessing me. While we're defiling the temple week after week after week. We act in selfish ways, and God says that's sin for your temple to be used for that. We are greedy, and God says that's sin. And we act that way anyway. And we're defiling the temple where God lives. Friends, we can't keep mocking God because that's exactly what it is when we willingly choose to live outside of his will while asking him to bless us it is mocking God we better step back and realize what we're doing because God will not be mocked and he will not bless impurity God has revealed himself to be pure and holy and there's no sin in him at all. He cannot dwell in the presence of sin and he refuses to do so. So when we willingly keep choosing to have sin in our lives, we are, we are just mocking God and daring him to withdraw his hand of blessing from our lives. God has called us to have a standard of purity as his people. And another problem we've got is, is we don't keep the same standard that God keeps. We've lowered the standards based on what the culture around us says is good and pure. When I was preparing for this message, I went to a website. Uh, I was looking at some material that another preacher had done on the sermon. And I went to a website they suggested, and it's the FDA's website, where they give you guidelines for the purity of the foods that we eat, that they put on the shelves. And you would think, well, the FDA is checking our food, so what we get on the grocery shelves must be okay, must be pretty good. Well, it depends, on how you define, it depends on how you define purity. Let me give you some of their guidelines. Any of you like apple butter? It's good stuff. In moderation, I like apple butter, okay? Here's what the standard is for apple butter. You'll be glad to know that if the mold count is 12% or more, if it averages four rodent hairs per 100 grams or more, If it averages five or more whole insects per 100 grams, the FDA will not allow it on the shelf. (laughs) Anything less than that's okay. It gets through, and they allow it on the shelves. Wow. Any of you like coffee? A lot of you coffee drinkers here? Yeah. 
Yeah. Some of you are worried about this one, aren't you? <laughs> Coffee beans will get withdrawn from the market only if an average of 10% or more are insect-infested beans. Or if there's one live insect in each of two or more immediate containers, then they'll pull it off the shelves. Think about that the next time you brew up your cup. <laughs> I have heard that insects have a high protein rating, so... <laughs> Mushrooms. The FDA says they can't be sold if there's an average of 20 or more maggots of any size per 15 grams of dried mushrooms. I bring that up because my wife loves mushrooms and <laughs> I don't. <so. laughs> but here's the thing. Even knowing that, most of us are still going to go do what? Eat apple butter, drink coffee and... My wife will still eat mushrooms because we've lowered the standard of purity that we think we have to have in those areas. We've done that spiritually too. We've decided certain things are acceptable. They're okay because the culture's decided they're okay even though God's word calls them sin. Even though God's word says it's impure. Even though God's word says it defiles the temple. We've decided to make it okay. We've changed the standards of purity to fit the way we want to live our lives. Here's the problem. Whose temple is it? It's God's. He says, you are not your own. You're bought with a price. The blood of his son, Jesus. He says, therefore, glorify God in your body in this temple. It belongs to him. He sets the standard of purity, not us. Because he's the one who owns the temple. It's built for him. To honor him. To bring glory to him. So we need to open up the doors of the temple. And clear out everything. That defiles the temple. If we want the blessing of God back. Into our lives. We need to clear out. That which we know. Is not in conformity. To God's word. Well there's another characteristic. Of his life that I think we need to adopt. And that is he had a commitment to humility as well. He had a commitment to humility. And I see it in this chapter in a couple of different ways. And some people, I think, will easily get the second one, but maybe we missed the first one. The first one is found in 2 Chronicles 31. Was something he did. He's clearing out the temple, everything that shouldn't be there. But then he's also putting things back in place that they weren't doing, that they should have been doing, that were also right with God and would bring the blessing of God to their lives. Listen to verse, thir- uh, verse 4 through 8 of chapter 31 he ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give the portion due the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord as soon as the order went out the Israelites generously gave first fruits of their grain new wine olive oil and honey and all that the fields produced they brought a great amount a tithe of everything the people of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah also brought a tithe of their herds and their flocks and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God and they piled them up in heaps and they began doing this in the third month through the seventh month when Hezekiah and his officials came and they saw the heaps the piles that they had brought in their offerings they praised the Lord and blessed his people Israel you say well well, bringing tithes and offerings what has that got to do with humility two things number one the kings before Hezekiah didn't care a thing about whether or not they brought offerings to God he just wanted everything for himself So they taxed the people and took it for themselves and did not give God his tithes or offerings. That was was putting himself in a place where God belonged. These other kings did. King Hezekiah understood that the tithe belongs to God. He has no right to take that and keep it for himself. So when he saw the people bringing their tithes and offerings back to God, he said that's devoted to God and he praised the people for doing that. But here's what I know on a personal basis. When we refuse to honor God with his tithes and our offerings, we are refusing to humble ourselves and say God is the provider for our lives. We are putting ourselves on the throne and saying, God, I'll take care of this. I got this. I don't need you for this. That's what the tithe is all about. It's never been about money. It's never been about paying the bills at the church. It's been about who's on the throne of your life. It's been about submission and humility 
before God the whole time. That's what it's about. And when you're not willing to humble yourself and show that God is the source of your blessings by bringing him his tithe, you are not living in humility before God. You're still keeping yourself on the throne of your life. That's what the tithe is really all about. And that's convicting to a lot of us, I know. Because I know the tithe is one of those areas where so few Christians are willing to let God be on the throne. Today in the church today, Barner Research says that less than 12% of all Christians across the board in the U.S. tithe to God. Less than 12% consistently bring their tithes to God. Is it any wonder God might withhold his hand of blessing on his people today when he's not being honored in that part of our lives? Well, he was willing to humble himself. There's another great example of that in chapter 32 and verse 24. It says he became ill and he was at the point of death and he prayed to God. God answered him and gave him a miraculous sign in response to his prayer. But it says Hezekiah's heart was proud. He didn't respond to the kindness shown him. Therefore, the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart as did the people of Jerusalem. And God's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. So when he was willing to repent and get his pride out of the way and humble himself before God, that's when the blessing of God was brought back to him and his people again. We need to repent of our pride if we want the hand of God to bless us in our lives. Well, there's one final characteristic. Number three is a commitment to prayer. Remember when the Assyrians were threatening to come defeat them? The first thing... That that Hezekiah did the first thing that Isaiah did is they went and prayed to God and asked for God to deliver them to protect them to help them but I want you to catch the connection God heard his prayer and answered his prayer in a powerful way why did he answer Hezekiah's prayer because Hezekiah was already committed to purity and humility and that puts your prayer in a place where it's, it's going to be answered in a positive way by the God who hears your prayers. How do we know that? Because the scripture is crystal clear on this. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the people were asking, why did God let all this bad stuff happen to us? Why are we suffering like this? Why are there so many problems in our lives? Here's what Isaiah said to them. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. It's not that he can't hear you praying. It's that he will not hear your prayers because you are choosing to hold on to that which defiles the temple as if it's okay. You're holding on to your sin. And your sin will always separate you from a holy, righteous God. Always. We want God's blessings, don't we? Then it's time we come clean with our sins. And bring them out in the open before God. Confess them willingly. And repent of them. Which means we never willingly choose to go on sinning anymore. Doesn't mean we don't ever mess up again. It means we don't ever choose to go back to a sinful lifestyle in the face of God. As our praise team gets ready, there's a passage that has been quoted a lot in this country, and I think it needs to be. But it's a warning that God had given earlier on in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. It's a warning and it's a promise of hope. Here's what it says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and not just pray. What else does he say to do? And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God was telling them the whole time, there's hope. No matter how far you've gone, no matter how much you've rebelled, If you will listen to the warning, if you will hear, if you will turn, if you will come back, there's hope. There can be blessing again. There can be, there can be the hand of God at work in your life to bless you again. But you've got to hear. You've got to listen. You've got to turn. 
You've got to come back to where I called you to be. Scholars have said for a long time, you know the four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Scholars have said for years there's actually five Gospels. There was a Gospel before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the Gospel of Isaiah. Isaiah was a messenger of God during this time period when they were in rebellion. And Isaiah sent a message to them. God sent a message to them through Isaiah of where their hope really would come from. The kings couldn't save them. The prophets couldn't do it for them. But there was one coming who could provide the cleansing, the purity that they needed. In Isaiah 9, he says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. He's saying again, if my people will hear me, if they will turn from their sin, if they will come to me, I will provide the cleansing, the purification. I will be able through the blood of my son Jesus to wash your temple clean and make it new and come and indwell that temple and give you life in a kingdom that will never end. The kingdom of God through my son Jesus. The question is, Will we keep looking for secret codes? Will we keep trying to do it some other way? Or will we simply accept the offer that God gives us when he sent his son here for us to provide that purity, that cleansing, that renewal of life? If you're ready today to receive what God offers, if you're willing, willing to humble yourself, to be purified by the blood of Jesus, he will provide that for you today. All you have to do is come, empty the temple of those things that defile it, and let the Spirit of God come and fill that temple. He says when you repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, He will give you the gift of His Spirit to come and indwell that temple with purity, with life eternal. As we stand and sing, we invite you to come.